Hey, good morning. It's Patricia Murphy. It's Monday. This is Seattle Now. With the pandemic seemingly slowing down, some say it's time for Governor Inslee to give up those special emergency powers that allow him to do things like shut down schools and mandate masks. Inslee says he still needs them, but Oregon's governor just gave them up last week. KUOW's Olympia correspondent Austin Jenkins will explain why it's so contentious in a minute. But first, let's get you caught up. A pilot shortage and labor standoff has Alaska Airlines apologizing to passengers. Alaska has canceled almost 300 flights since Friday, affecting tens of thousands of passengers. Alaska's Pilots Union has been picketing in Seattle and other West Coast cities to put pressure on the airline for a better contract. They've been negotiating since before the pandemic started. An Alaska spokesperson told the Seattle Times service should even out over the next couple of days. Two sailors were injured over the weekend in an explosion on board a nuclear sub docked at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton. The Navy says the accident occurred during a routine test on Saturday. The cause is being investigated. The USS Louisiana is an Ohio-class ballistic missile submarine, which are the largest in the Navy's fleet. The Navy says the submarine's nuclear propulsion area was not affected. And it's going to be a wild, windy weather day. The National Weather Service predicts gusts up to 40 miles an hour in the Seattle area, maybe even some hail. There'll be heavy snow in the mountains and big waves at the beaches, too. Be prepared for power outages and keep an eye out for falling trees. Things should be wrapped up by Tuesday. Governor Jay Inslee has been the face of our COVID response here. He used special emergency powers to order people to stay home and send students home from school. Not everyone agreed with the governor's choices, and some conservatives took issue with his power. Former gubernatorial candidate Lauren Culp made it a central theme during his campaign. We don't need a nanny. We don't need a mommy or a daddy in the governor's office telling us what to do, telling us we can open our business or we can't open our business. And while Culp lost the election, his position on the governor was hardly rejected. 1.7 million people voted for him. Of course, the governor's special emergency powers made sense during this extraordinary time. Now a lot of states are saying the emergency is over. Oregon Governor Kate Brown ended her state's order on Friday. Northwest News Network reporter Austin Jenkins is here to tell us more about these emergency powers and the debate around when to end them. Hey, Austin, glad you're here. Hello, Patricia. So let's talk about the emergency powers themselves. What powers does the state of emergency give the governor? Broad powers. I mean, really, Washington has one of the most expansive state of emergency laws in the country. And this is a law. This is something the legislature passed. And it essentially says in a state of emergency, the governor has broad powers to regulate our comings and goings, to shut things down. Now, of course, this law wasn't passed with a pandemic necessarily in mind. Lawmakers were probably thinking about all manner of emergencies, and most emergencies are much more geographically contained. But what has really made this one so different is that it was a global pandemic. These orders affected the entire state of Washington, and it's gone on for so long. Yeah, those are all really important points, Austin. Perhaps the legislators never considered a global pandemic. This, on the other hand, has been a test of the governor's powers in a lot of ways because it does affect the entire state, the entire population. Why did people react so strongly in this case? Was it the power or was it what he was using it to do? I think it's those factors and elements, the fact that this pandemic became so political, and that wasn't just here in Washington state. You had the overlay of the 2020 election, And the lead up to that, along with the pandemic. So politics and the pandemic were intertwined and inseparable here. And in some ways, I think that the governor's actions and his emergency powers became kind of a convenient target. Now, that's not to say that they didn't impact people's bottom line and impact people's sense of freedom and autonomy. For sure they did. But the governor's actions became kind of an animating issue or topic or or an easy target if you will. 
Absolutely. And in a lot of ways, it comes down to how much power the governor has. And throughout the pandemic, people on the right end of the political spectrum have argued that he has had too much control here. We heard Lauren Culp at the top saying, you know, we don't need a nanny, we don't need a mommy to roars of applause. I wonder if the conversation has changed at all. It it has. And, you know, Lauren Culp staked out a pretty extreme position. It was earlier on in the pandemic. Uh, His rhetoric was really fiery. But legislative Republicans and Republican leaders in the legislature who were essentially saying, yeah, we need to have an Emergency Powers Act. This is a state of emergency, but this goes too far. We're saying we've got to curb this. We've got to reel this in. We've got to bring some balance back, and the legislature needs to have more of a say. And that was something we heard a lot from Republicans in 2020 into the 2021 legislative session. What changed this year in 2022 is majority Democrats seemed more willing to have the conversation. And there were actual hearings and some bills moved forward to try to amend or curtail to some extent the governor's powers. Now, in the end, they didn't pass But the conversation was being had in a way that it hadn't previously. Let's talk about the argument for ending the emergency order. What are you hearing? Well, the argument that we hear from Republican leaders, and we've seen some joint statements just in recent weeks from Senator John Braun, who's the Senate Republican leader, and from Representative J.T. Wilcox, the House Republican leader, is that the crisis is over, the emergency is over, that this pandemic is becoming more of an endemic, that other states have lifted their restrictions in states of emergency, and that Washington should follow suit, and that there are mechanisms in place if this should reignite and kick up again, that that there's nothing to foreclose the governor, for instance, from declaring a new state of emergency or from the legislature coming into special session to address issues that need to be addressed. So their argument is it's time to end this. And I think really where they're coming down on is that this it's it's a it's a issue of time. They think it's gone on for too long, two plus years. What's the governor's rationale for keeping the emergency order? And further, what's it going to take for him to say we're done? Well, here's what he's saying. At this point, there is no timeline to rescind what's still in place in Washington, including the state of emergency. He does say, though, that two-thirds of the proclamations that were associated with his emergency order have been rescinded. And, you know, he wants credit for that. There are signs that we have backed away from the worst of this crisis and emergency. He also argues that the state of emergency should remain in place because the state should be ready and able to respond to changing levels of COVID-19 activity and that this emergency declaration gives the states the tools to do that in case it needs to respond quickly. There is some talk or some concern about access to federal funding. So that's the governor's position. He may be out of step with many other states and even some other Democrats, but he seems pretty confident in his position and unswayed by, for instance, Oregon letting its emergency declaration sunset. You know, you made the point that the governor could just declare another emergency if we were to lift it now and something went sideways with the pandemic. Why doesn't this seem appropriate? Uh, you know, I don't have insight into his how his mind works necessarily. I can imagine that there there's a calculation here that says better to keep the status quo than to end the state of emergency and then to have to reinstate it. Like what psychologically for the people, you know, what would be worse? If the state of emergency isn't really affecting people in a dramatic way on a day-to-day basis and it's just sort of there in the background, I can imagine he might think that's better than saying, OK, it's over today. And then in three weeks, he has to come back and say, sorry, folks, I got to declare another state of emergency. Yeah. Yeah. You could see this. Uh, the speculation, is he being prudent or is he being power hungry at this point? Absolutely. His critics think that this is about power and it's quite convenient to do things without having to consult with the other branches of government. The governor will also note that he's been sued numerous times over his emergency orders and he's never lost in court. Good point. Austin, COVID cases have been flat for a while now, but last week here in King County, we saw them start ticking up just a little bit. Has the governor explained what the plan is if there's another big surge? He hasn't. He hasn't laid that out in terms of metrics, for instance. But what we do know is that the metric he cares the most about is hospitalizations and hospital capacity. So 
an uptick in cases by itself, I do not think is going to be enough for him to start to put mandates or requirements back on. If he sees a big uptick in hospitalizations such that the hospitals are saying they're getting into trouble, that's when I would start to pay attention. And of course, he also cares about deaths, although fortunately, it seems that these variants and subvariants aren't as deadly. And, you know, a lot of people are vaccinated, which helps them to weather, if they get sick, weather it better. So I really think that the hospitalization one is the key metric and that there is no sense at this point and certainly no enthusiasm for, for instance, reinstating a mask mandate. Could that happen? Would he do it if he felt he needed to? Yes. But I I don't think that that is imminent or something that they think they're going to have to do at this point. Austin, it sounds like it's going to take something pretty extraordinary to bring us back to where we were before. I am curious, though, how this might live on politically. Absolutely. I mean, remember, this is an election year. And I think Republicans, legislative Republicans, certainly think that this is a viable campaign issue for them. We know that they're already polling and testing kind of the mood of voters in the context of the governor's record and handling of this pandemic and his emergency powers. Certainly for a segment of the population, this is it resonates. It's an important issue to them. It animates them. And so much of elections is about getting people to vote, right, to participate and be engaged. you got to find those issues that bring people into politics and wanting to participate. And this might be, at least in some districts, an issue that Republicans can really uh, work with. Really interesting. Thanks so much, Northwest News Network reporter Austin Jenkins. Really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Hey, before we go, KUOW's spring membership drive is on right now. Seattle Now listeners, we need your help to meet our goal. $2 a month, $5 a month, maybe a one-time gift. Whatever you can afford makes it possible for us to bring you this show every weekday. There's a link in the show notes to donate. Mention Seattle Now, and we'll give you a shout-out by name on the show. Thanks. Claire McGrain produced today's show. Matt Jorgensen does our theme music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow.